All right, welcome everyone. Good evening. Uh, yeah, welcome to the first uh, first uh, SPDA presentation of the season here in January 2022. Um, for those of you who are new to this, um, we we started doing these uh, last year in 2021 uh, in January. Uh, you know, we've had uh, monthly SPDA presentations for for decades, but it was always in person at the at the Willard Green uh, at, at, at Laurentian here in Sudbury. Uh, but obviously with, with COVID, uh, we had to go uh, virtual. So we started doing these uh, Zoom presentations and, and uh, we're recording these. So they're, and they're being put up on the SPDA's uh, YouTube channel and, and on LinkedIn as well. So we already had nine presentations last last uh, year that were well, well attended and they're, they're all recorded so you can find them up uh up on linkedin uh, or on, on on youtube and you know there was some really good presentations there for from from some of these companies that you can see here also on the screen like kennerland uh exiro gave a talk frontier eventus um uh, yeah ryan weston gave a gave a talk from norant so um yeah, so you know, I'd like to first start with with uh, with thanking you know all of our corporate sponsors that you can see here on the on the screen. They've helped us a lot in in putting these on, uh, you know, doing the recordings and and uh, organizing this and, and making it available. And of course, you know, thanks also to to all of the SPDA uh, individual members. Uh, you know, being January, uh, just a reminder that you know if you're interested in in uh, maintaining your SPDA membership uh, or becoming an SPDA member, you know, please uh, email us there on, on that email address that you can see on the screen to to support the organization so we can we can uh, keep doing these presentations. You know, I'm really happy to welcome Animals Gold today. Uh, you know, starting off the season here, uh, Scott Parsons, the the VP Exploration of Animals, will give us a uh, you know, a bit of a corporate uh, update on, 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 on their activities. And for those of you, you know, a lot of you probably know Scott, uh, either from his time, you know, he, he just uh, had his, I think, your four, four year uh, anniversary at, at Alamos. But before that, you know, he was at, uh, at TMAC, uh, you know, Hope Day at TMAC. And, uh, or you might even know him from Northern Superior, where he was. Obviously, he's, he's well connected here with, with some of the Sudbury geologists and having worked with, with Norton Superior. So yeah, we're very happy to, to have him give us an update. And then afterwards, we'll have uh, Carl uh, Nanji, who, uh, uh, who's a senior exploration geologist with, uh, with Alamos. And he'll give us a you know, deep dive on, on island gold, sort of the you know, new geology interpretations Carl Carl was, uh, you know, before he joined Alamos, uh, I think three years ago in 2019, he was uh, working at Red Lake with uh, with Newmont Gold Corp, and uh, you know, also structural geology consultant uh, with SRK. So lots of uh, you know structural geology background there, and 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 they've done a really good reinterpretation of of island gold. So you know, very curious to 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 see that. And um, yeah, to me, Island Gold is kind of, it's a special treat anyways, to, to listen to this talk today, because, uh, uh, you know, going back a few years when we acquired Fenelon with Wal Walbridge, uh, when Fenelon was just a small uh, near surface high grade resource, uh, we often use Island Gold sort of as an analog of what we think Fenelon might become. and and. Uh, you know, being being an amazing gold deposit that I think now extends down to close to two kilometers. So, yeah, it's a it's, it's a pretty pretty awesome deposit. So, yeah, very very keen on on uh, hearing more about it. So, yeah, with further ado, uh, let's start off with uh, with Scott. Please uh, share your screen. I'll uh, I'll stop the screen share myself. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, very happy this worked out. I know we've been coordinating or trying to coordinate for 
at least a, a year now for this talk to happen. So thanks to yourself and, and Ed and the SPDA for uh, for uh, inviting us to give the presentation. I think uh, just as a uh, for introduction, I'll start with uh, for those that aren't familiar with Almos, just a, a ten minute overview of the company. For those that are familiar, you know we're going through a significant growth phase. So I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, our projects and our pipeline of growth that's coming up and, and particularly with a focus in, uh, in Canada. And then I'll hand it over to Carl um, after that for uh, his talk, which is kind of the main event of this, uh, of this presentation, which is on the island geological model, which is, you know, in my opinion, a phenomenal piece of work. I think it's key exploration tool, um, you know, right from the, you know, the mine site for, you know, planning production to exploration, mine site exploration to regional exploration. So um, I'm sure everybody will be, interested to hear about how we're applying the deposit scale geologic model to all of those uh, scales of targeting. So uh, this image you're seeing on the on the screen is a recent image of um, a project in Sonora, Mexico. It's a, a new mine we're, we're building right now called Daqui Grande. Uh, we're expecting co commercial production from this mine uh, the second half of uh, 2022. Um, and right now it's uh, and we're forecasting on time on budget, which is excellent and, and looking forward to getting that up and running. It's a, a low cost uh, a mine that uh, um, you know, will produce for the next uh, seven years in the Mulatos uh, district. Uh, on to the next slide, Let's see if I can advance it. Um, I'm gonna read through this kind of word by word. So hopefully everybody's got a bit of time. <laughs> um, I will be making forward looking statements in this presentation. So um, I encourage you to review the cautionary notes if you're if you're interested or don't if you're not interested. Um, slide the next slide is is an introductory slide for Alamos. So Alamos Gold, we're a Canadian-based intermediate gold producer. Uh, we have diversified production from three operating mines. They're all in North America. Uh, Alamos, you know, has grown considerably. Recording since it was founded, in progress. Since it was founded in uh, in 2003. Um, in fact, as recently as 2014, just uh, you know, eight years ago, we were a single asset producer, and we were operating the Mulatos mine in, in Sonora, Mexico, and we were producing about 150,000 ounces of gold per year. Since then, um, we've completed two significant acquisitions, and, and we've transformed Alamos into a company where it's producing nearly 500,000 ounces of gold per year, um, anchored by a 10 million ounce mineral reserve base. So big, big change in, in eight years, and, and we're positioned for significant growth going forward. <clears throat> Over uh, two thirds of our production and our revenue come from our Young Davidson and Island Gold Mines, which are both in Northern Ontario. Uh, both, both of these mines have 14 year mine lives, um, uh, more than 14 in some cases. And we have large exploration programs that are ongoing at both of the sites. And that objective is to further extend the mine life. And I'm you know, very confident we'll be successful in doing that, investing heavily into exploration. Uh, as detailed uh, uh, in our guidance last week, you know, we're seeing a, a slight increase in our all and sustaining costs by about 8% in 2022, um, which is driven by 5% uh, cost inflation roughly, which the industry is seeing this kind of across the board is just inflationary pressure. Um, then we see, you know, as we transition from production of mulattoes in the first half of the year to low cost production at Lackey Grande, um, that kind of transition period results in slightly higher costs for the, the first part of 2022, but that's temporary and, and you know, our growth profile really demonstrates those costs coming down in the second half of 2022 and moving forward. Um, beyond our operating mines, we ha and within our operating mines, we have excellent organic growth projects. And, and this is key because we can increase our production internally uh, to 750,000 ounces a year by 2025. And we expect while doing that, that our all in sustaining costs will decrease to $800 per ounce over that same time frame as we bring these projects on board. So these growth projects include the high return uh, Lackey Grande project, which I showed a picture of in the opening slide, and a Lynn Lake project in Manitoba. Um, also uh, Island Gold phase three expansion, which we'll talk about, which very, very excited about. I don't know if that was on my screen. I had a notice that it was being recorded. Um, in, in terms of employees, you know, Almost Gold, we employ 1800 people globally. Um, and our people are the key to our company's successful growth and execution. Um, without the people, you know, it'd be tough to run this business or impossible to run the business. Of the 1,800 employees, a, th a thousand of those employees are here in Ontario. Um, and our core values as a company are focused around safety, teamwork, uh, environmental sustainability, integrity, and commitment. And that drives pretty much everything we do. 
I'll now focus a bit on our, our Canadian uh, assets in more detail. And I'll start with uh, Young Davidson, which is uh, located in Metachewan, just west of Kirkland Lake. It's one of Canada's largest underground gold mines. 90% of our workforce at Young Davidson is local and, and we're an important employer in the region, uh, accounting for about 15% of total mining employment in the area. And we also contribute significantly, significantly to the local economy, about $17 million a year of economic benefits that flow back into the, uh, the regional uh, economy. And as I mentioned before, there's a 14 year reserve life at Young Davidson and, and there's significant expiration potential on top of that. Um, this will ensure this operation is a significant employer and contributor uh, for decades to come. For those that aren't aware, um, in, in 2020, we had completed a construction of our lower mine infrastructure. This is a big project, um, which has now enabled us to increase our mining rates from 6,000 to 8,000 tons per day. Uh, the expansion has made Young Davidson far more efficient and far more productive. And it'll, basically what it'll do is enable us to produce 200,000 ounces of gold per year, which at current gold prices will generate $100 million of free cash flow annually. In addition, on the exploration front, we have a significant underground exploration program with a 22,000 meters drilling planned. This drilling is all from underground exploration drifts that we set up uh, in the lower mine infrastructure, testing areas that uh, had seen limited previous drilling. We've also initiated a, a regional exploration program that we're focusing on exploring along Strike of Young Davidson, so along the Cadillac Water Lake Break. And we're also looking at a number of these second and third order structures, both in the Temiskaming sediments and the Tisdale uh, domains high potential, uh, high pers highly prospective uh, uh, lithologies. And then I'm, now I'll move over to Island Gold with a few slides. When we, uh, this is a tremendous success story, story from when we acquired this, this asset in 2017 through acquiring Richmond Mines. When we, when we did acquire the deposit, it had uh, 1.8 million ounces of reserves and resources. And since then we've added an additional 3 million ounces all through the drill bit. And this discovery has been at an industry leading low cost of $11 per ounce, which is, is spectacular and speaks to, the, speaks to the endowment of this deposit. And at the same time, uh, we've expanded our mining rates from 800 tons a day when we acquired it to, to now 1,200 tons a day. Island's now approaching 5 million ounces in mineral reserves and resources. It's one of the highest grade, most profitable gold mines in the world. We're currently investing, expanding the operation with a, a phase three expansion project from 1,200 tons a day to 2,000 tons a day. And we expect to have this completed by 2025. Island, is, is, as soon as Young Davidson is in, in, in the Metachewan Kirkland Lake area, Island's an important employer in, in the region as well, accounting for 15% of the mining employment in the, in the overall Algoma region. And we also contribute significantly to the local economy, uh, about 12 million a year of economic benefits to the regional economy. As I mentioned, like, as I mentioned, the exploration success that we've had over the last number of years, um, you know, it's resulted in uh, the decision to install a shaft as part of the phase three expansion project, which will bring us up to 2000 tons a day by 2025. It'll bring gold production from currently 140,000 ounces a year to 240,000 ounces a year and driving our all in sustaining costs to industry low levels of around $530 US per ounce. Uh, the, the phase three expansion project at 1750 gold uh, has a net present value of $1.45 billion. And not included in that uh, phase three expansion study is the additional million ounces of reserve and resource we added uh, since that study was completed. So further upside uh, to that story. Well, so our, well, our current plans for growth at the island are, are exciting. Um, there's more growth to come. We're continuing uh, to invest heavily in exploration. Uh, drilling in 2021 20, um, continued to intersect high grade gold mineralization um, at depth into the east uh, outside of our existing uh, resources. One of the highlights, uh, it's not on this image, but I'll, I'll refer to is, is what we're calling the best hole that's ever been drilled at Island Gold, which we drilled in 2021. It was MH2508 intersected 71 grams per ton or 40 grams per ton cut over 21 meters true width. So that was the best gram meter metal factor intersection ever drilled at Island. And that's out of over a million meters of drilling across the deposit and 7,000 drill holes. It speaks to the you know, opportunities to continue to expand this, this deposit. And, and Carl will talk about some of the controls on that you know, wide high grade mineralization. We talked about the geologic model. And the, the graph on the left of this slide, it shows the, uh, the reserve and resource growth based on all the exploration we've done. And uh, as I mentioned, we will continue to invest heavily in exploration at Island. And we have $28 million budgeted 
for expiration in 2022 at Island Gold. Uh, Lynn Lake, it's, it, this project's in Northwestern Manitoba. It's a high grade open pit project. It's in an area with really good infrastructure. It's got access to low cost hydro generated electric power. And it's located in a very supportive mining jurisdiction in Manitoba and in particular Northwestern Manitoba. We completed a feasibility study in 2017 on Lynn Lake and at $1,500 an ounce gold, the project had uh, after tax IRR of 22%. Since we've completed the feasibility study, We've increased mineral reserves by 500,000 ounces or 26% from 1.6 million ounces to 2.1 million ounces at, uh, between Gordon and McClellan, which are the two deposits at Lynn Lake that we're uh, permitting right now. And we've also developed a, a much stronger uh, geological appreciation of the exploration potential across the belt, both around the existing deposits uh, at some of the advanced exploration targets we have and regionally across this 80 kilometer long greenstone belt that essentially divided into two segments, the north and south belt with uh, crustal scale structures and favorable lithologies across the, uh, across the property. And, and you know, surprising uh, for, for Northwest Manitoba and for Lynn Lake, it's had a mining history. You know, some of this area has not been explored for for gold and uh, we're seeing some significant opportunities. Um, we're more than halfway through what, what we expect to be a two year permitting process, which should put us in a, a position to make a construction decision for Lynn Lake in the second half of, of this year. Assuming that we move ahead, um, we expect that this operation will produce at a rate of approximately 170,000 ounces a year uh, at uh, low all and sustaining costs around $745 US per ounce, which would also begin in 2025. From an exploration perspective, as, as I touched on, um, you know, there's a lot of potential here. And, and we, we announced a new uh, discovery in, in December of 2021, so fairly recently, which we're calling Taloon. You can see in the map between uh, Gordon and McClellan in the, uh, in the North Belt, about 13 kilometers northwest of Gordon and 20 kilometers east of McClellan. And just to emphasize this point, and I think it's a critical point that we need to make, um, it's the importance of the boots on the ground prospecting and, and really good geology. The Taloon was discovered through prospecting in 2015. It's in an area where there wasn't uh, previous, any gold no mineralization known previously. And it was just an area that was uh, being prospected as part of kind of a regional exploration program. Um, some high grade uh, boulders were discovered, which resulted in subsequent field programs um, over the course of a couple of field seasons of you know, ge geologic mapping, uh, lots of additional prospecting. And that led, led up to working up targets where we made a decision where we wanted to dr start drilling here in 2020 and that led into 2021. Um, to date, every hole at this target has intersected gold mineralization. Um, which, which is extremely exciting and we'll continue to explore here uh, in 2022 uh, and, and evaluate this, this you know, hopefully a large gold system that we're uh, just scratching the surface of with our initial drilling. So th this is one example at Lynn Lake of you know, outside of the reserves, the 2.1 million ounces of reserves that we're you know, permitting and, and moving forward with, uh, hopefully with a positive construction decision upon receipt of the permit. You know, this Taloon highlights the pipeline and the prospectivity of the pipeline of regional targets that we have across the Greenstone Belt at Lynn Lake that we'll evaluate for years to come. I'm excited about that. In terms of um, ESG, it's been a core part of our, our company's culture uh, since it was founded in 2003. And, and the focus you know, is on continuous improvement under the ESG front. And I think it's evident in our track record in many of the initiatives that we have underway across of our, our sites. We're all we're continuously looking for ways to minimize our impact and reduce our footprint. Some examples of that, you know, greenhouse gas emissions and water use across our sites per ounce of gold produced are, are well below the intermediate and senior producer average. And these, these are metrics we'll continue to look to improve um, with an, continuous improvement initiatives away across, underway across all of our sites. Under the uh, social umbrella, we're focused on a culture of safety first, and we're seeing results with uh, 59% decrease in lost time injury rate over the past two years. Through our Home Safe Everyday program, this is an area where we're always striving uh, to improve uh, over time as well and learn, uh, as we, uh, learn from uh, uh, experiences uh, and continually improve. Within our host communities, we, we're also investing in ways that provide ongoing benefits and well beyond the life of our operations. And, and we have been recognized for these, these efforts across our uh, operations. And then the last point uh, with respect to governance, we're maintaining a diverse and independent board and we built and we'll continue to refine the framework to ensure accountability across uh, all of our stakeholder groups. 
And uh, the core value, this is a slide on, on COVID and I think it's relevant to, to touch on before handing it over to Carl. Um, core value of our company is, is health and safety. Um, and as I mentioned, we have a home safe every day program that governs our safety practices and uh, the commitment uh, to continuous improvement in this, in this front. Uh, response to the COVID-19 pandemic is an example of uh, our focus on safety. Uh, we, were, we were proactive in implementing procedures and protocols early on in the pandemic. Um, we hired independent medical advisors to support the development of social distancing and COVID-related policies and procedures um, while everybody else was still you know, re reacting and trying to figure everything out. We we're one of the first companies based on that advice to uh, conduct screening of our employees to keep COVID-19 away from our mine sites. And we screen currently at all of our sites. We've now conducted over 100,000 COVID tests and, and uh, since we introduced uh, site-based testing in 2020. And this is uh, my, my handover slide for uh, Carl's presentation. But before I, I hand it over to him, I just make a, a few points on uh, what Carl's gonna speak to because I think it's, it's critical. Um, so both myself and, and everybody at Alamos for that matter, we strongly believe that the geological model is essential to understand what's controlling the mineralization of your deposit. And as I, I said in my introductory statement, from, you know, this is from the regional scale, deposit scale, down to stope scale in the mine to be able to make you know, effectively inform decisions, whether those are production decisions or expiration strategies um, across the board. So you know, the island team has put a considerable amount of time, dedication, and, and a lot of effort into developing this model. And we'll continue to evolve it as we get more information over time. By no means is this static. It's, it's, and Carl will speak to this. It'll be constantly evolving as we get more information and test these ideas. Um, I'm very pleased to have Carl here today instead of me presenting this to you because he's much better, better in terms of uh, presenting it because he's one of the key technical leads on the project. He worked uh, closely with Michelle Cote, who's our chief exploration geologist, and you know, as well as a highly skilled team of enthusiastic geologists uh, at Island to build this model. And this didn't happen you know, overnight. This took a, a lot of relogging, a lot of geochemistry, a lot of structural measurements, underground mapping, which Carl will touch on to, to, to establish this model. So with those comments, I'll uh, stop showing my screen. I'll hand it over to Carl, who's, uh, as Attila mentioned, a senior exploration geologist at Island Gold, and he'll present the Island Gold geological model and uh, how we're applying that uh, to exploration targeting. So thank you very much. If there are any questions, we'll, uh, we'll pause at the end for those. Thanks, Scott. Um, so I'll just share, can I share my, I think I might have to, there we go. I think you can, yeah. All right. So just uh, could someone just confirm that you're seeing the full screen PowerPoint? Yes, we can see it. Yeah, we're good. Perfect. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that great intro, Scott. Thanks, Attila and Ed, for, for having us here tonight. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for joining. So um, yeah, as everyone mentioned, my name is Carl, and I have the opportunity to work with the, the generative or the regional exploration team at Island Gold and a big part of what we, we've we done over the last little bit is put together, like Scott's mentioned, uh, a geological model for the deposit and, and we're working on how we can apply this to our exploration process all the way from in mine through to Greenfields-esque exploration. And, and when we say model, what we really mean is we what, we've, what we're working on putting together, what we've put together and what we're continuously refining is our, is our geologic understanding of the deposit. Um, and the controls on mineralization and model. Definitely when we think model, we go right away to wireframes and, and ultimately that's a component of it. But the biggest component in my mind of the model is that understanding. And, and so what I hope to kind of convey maybe over the next half an hour-ish is, is really not any specifics, any kind of geologic detail or particular wireframe or this or that, but rather how we can develop our geologic understanding um, through pretty core practices, nothing you know revolutionary rocket science, then how that works its way into our exploration workflow. So I'll, uh, I'll emphasize that over and over and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully that makes its way through by the end of the presentation. Uh, and uh, so let's get, uh, let's get deep into the geology here. A uh, little, little background. Um, so as, as many of you guys know, uh, this is what the kind of regional gold profile looks like in the area. Island Gold Mine sits over here within the Mitch Picot and Greenstone Belt. That's a 
That's this guy over here. And then we have the, Mich uh, the Michi belt over here, which has West Dome's operations. And of course, Hemlo and, and Sugar Zone uh, up to the north. So within the Mitchell-Picotin belt, the, the only major current active producer is Island. We produced over a million ounces to date, uh, if you were to include the, the most up-to-date production. Uh, there's a historic mine called Renabi, previously owned by Barrick. They produce just over a million ounces. And apart from that, we just have a few small neighbors, uh, historic mines, uh, Magino, Klein, Edwards, Kremsar, and they're all in the range of 50, 150 thousand ounces at kind of variable grades, but typically kind of reasonable underground potential grades. Um, Magino, you probably heard of uh, Argonaut is, is revamping that into their new open pit operation. So one more slide, uh, I promise this is the last slide with, with numbers and reserves and resources, and then we'll go full geology. So just another snapshot of the island. Uh, Scott showed this in his presentation. Uh, so just a reminder of what it looks like uh, in terms of reserve resources and mine outs. So in uh, light blue is our inferred resources, uh, and then in dark blue measured and indicated, and in yellow are reserves. And you can see the numbers in the bottom left there. As Scott alluded to, we've got almost 5 million ounces at this deposit, and it's, it really is already something remarkable and, and turning into something even more remarkable. So it's definitely a, a pleasure and an opportunity to work there. Um, a couple things from this slide to remember as we move forward. The big one being so these two purple uh, wireframes in the middle, these are two diabase dikes that, that transect the mine. And we're going to keep them in a lot of figures moving forward. And uh, they'll be a good reference for where we are. We're going to flip around up, down, bottom, top. So just keep in mind these two dikes bisecting the mine. You can think of the mine roughly as a kind of east, east, northeast trending feature bisected by kind of two orthogonal dikes. All right, so now we're into the geology, I promise. Um, so stepping out to the geology of the belt. So this is the uh, island gold mine sits here within the Mitchell-Picotin greenstone belt. Wawa sits roughly down here, if you've ever kind of driven through uh, Northern Ontario. They've got the slowest Tim Hortons, uh, I think west of Sudbury. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, fairly typical greenstone belt in some senses, you know, sequences of, uh, of meta volcanic meta sedimentary rocks. And the island gold mine sits on the north side of this feature right here. And uh, we call this the Goudreau anticline. It's essentially a large anticline uh, composed of felsic, felsic to intermediate volcanic and intrusive rocks. And so this big scale geometry will, will, will relate to our small scale geometry and then back to our big scale geometry at the end, hopefully. So moving on to our deposit. Uh, geology. This is a plan map of the deposit. In red here is the surface expression of the mineralization that sits underneath the uh, Goudreau Lake. So a considerable strike extent um, when you project it up to surface. This is an all economic mineralization. It's really the trace of the mineralized shear zone. Um, and then further to the left, you'll see a few surface traces uh, in red here. And this would be the surface trace of the mineralization um, on the Magino or Argonaut side of things. So really most likely the, the same mineralizing system as island. So we're talking about quite a, quite a big one here. Uh, and then the mineralization sits within this, this tan unit, so a, which is a large diorite intrusion, essentially a large uh, felsic to intermediate porphyritic rock. And that rock is cut up by a series of uh, of felsic to mafic dikes and intrusions, a couple of them notable in particular in this pink one right here, which is uh, uh, this linear felsic intrusion, a granitic intrusion that we uh, term the Web Lake stock or Web Lake intrusion. We'll come back to it a few times. And there's a, a series of other gabbro and intermediate dikes and we'll touch on them, not so much for what their exact pathology or composition is, but rather kind of what they can tell us in relation to mineralization and how they can help with guide our exploration. You'll also notice that the entire thing is bisected by a series of Northeast and Southeast structures. And these of course will come into play as well. So Scott alluded to, we, we've done quite a bit of work on the geology of the deposit. Um, and I'm just gonna touch on a few key elements here in order to try to kind of convey that, uh, that message. So there might be some things that are uh, 
glossed over a little bit. Talk about a couple of key lithologies. So the bulk of the deposit sits within this, this unit that we can see in the upper left. These are two pieces of core. This is a kind of porphyritic diorite and an aphanitic one and a thin section example of it. So that's the bulk of the deposit. Think of it as the host rock. And we're going to talk about really on this slide is what you can see in the upper right here. And these are uh, QFP, fairly typical QFP units. And when you kind of pick them out systematically throughout the deposit and then and then interpret them and visualize them and model them, uh, you get the sense of their distribution. They form these, uh, these lenses. So if we look in long section down here on the bottom left, these two dikes here are the dikes that, uh, that we saw in that reserve resource wire frame, or sorry, reserve resource slide earlier on. So just for context, kind of the core of the deposit is right here. And then you can see these series of, uh, of QFP dikes that are plunging to the east. Take a look at kind of the section right here. That's the section in the middle here. So in slightly upper elevations of the mine, you can see they're fairly steep, kind of jogging down a little bit. And then if we look in the lower portion of the mine over here at these lenses, we can see them that they've really shallowed out. They're kind of curved, uh, moderate to shallowly dipping to the south. So what these lenses are telling us, and we can combine them with a whole bunch of other things to see that is, they're essentially acting as a proxy to the geometry of our stratigraphy. So we know we're in a big folded uh, anticline on a regional scale. So we know that the folding, I mean, in, as in is the case in really any, you know, greenstone hosted deposit, the folding is going to be an important element. But as in, but as is the case in a lot of greenstone hosted deposits, understanding or seeing your folding or seeing a lot of structures can often be pretty cryptic depending on what your host topology are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in this case, we're able to use our QFP lenses as a proxy for our deposit scale full geometry. So we'll come back to how this, all these things relate to mineralization kind of in the latter part of the presentation. Uh, so a couple more important lithologies. So what we're looking at here are dikes, and you can think of them as just felsic through to mafic, potentially even ultra mafic dikes. Some examples, we have gabbro dikes in the top left. We have some uh, diagnostically felsic dikes on the left and some kind of um, mine units, or you know, we'll call them on the, just sitting beside that. And the reason that we we're putting a lot of emphasis on dikes is because when you're in these cryptic environments where it's hard to see different units, different lithologies, different structures, the dikes are often stand out and they can be one of the things that we can, um, that we can identify, we can log, we can extract from historic data very systematically. So we've broken the dikes in this figure here into three different uh, sets. So if we look at the set on the left here, where my cursor is, you can see these dikes coming down fairly steeply and then shallowing out. And so these dikes here are doing the same thing that we saw our QFP lenses doing in the previous slide. They're mimicking the, the folded geometry of the deposit. This set of dikes up here in the upper right image are all striking to the southeast, and they're all very steeply dipping, subvertical. And then here in the bottom right, they're all striking to the northeast, and they're steeply dipping, subvertical again. And so what these are showing us three different structural sets that are going to become quite relevant. One, stratigraphy, and two, are, uh, are sets of shearing. So let's go to the next slide here. Uh, right. Uh, okay, so here we're looking at uh, the, la the last slide on lithology. We've got a couple of units on this slide. One is that that granitic intrusion that uh, we saw on the plan map, and that's this guy up here. We call it Web Lake Stock. You can see it in pink here, and this is a cross section with north and south. We're looking west. You can see the granitic intrusion dipping to the north. Then we have our mineralized, this is the main mineralized horizon that's dipping to the south. And neither of them follow stratigraphy exactly, but they're both taking advantage of stratigraphy. So you can begin to also use this to see kind of where the core of that, uh, of that fold might be somewhere right in here with one limb dipping to the south and the other to the north. And you can see it in long section down here on the right with our dikes for reference. Taking a, going back to our dikes, our diabase dikes, there's, there's many sets of them, but we're showing two sets here. 
So these uh, these north trending sets that bisect the deposit as well as these subhorizontal ones. And so these north trending diabase dikes are filling later structures. And what's nice is that when we can use these guys as a proxy for these late, uh, more brittle structures that tend to offset the deposit and all of the geology, as opposed to the other series of dikes which we use for identifying other structural sets. So that's all the lithology. So I'm going to dump, jump into structure now. So we can break down the structure of the deposit into three, uh, essentially three broad events. So the first big event would be compression. So, and this is like this series of events is pretty typical for most greenstone hosted environments. So early on, we compress things, we form our broad scale. And in our case, it's broad scale upright folding. Often that folding gets transposed and it gets overturned and things like that. And this is where you develop that infrastructure within which you're gonna over, you're gonna put the gold mineralization in. Uh, and don't mind my little cartoon schematics here. I did my, my best. Uh, and then the second event is our strike slip event, or it's most likely more of a transpressional event, which is a fancy word for just saying we're compressing and we're strike slipping. This is essentially the event where you develop your, your different shear zone arrays. And these are the structures that, that host the bulk of the gold mineralization. So on our little schematic here, you can see we went, we, we compressed everything, and then you essentially move from compression to some type of movement like this, where you develop these, these structural arrays, so these sets of different shear zones. And then once all that's done, we continue deforming, and we have a whole bunch of, uh, of modification to our mineralization. So some of that's through, you know, those diabase faults we were referring to that, that kind of down drop or rotate the whole, the whole deposit and, and region. And we also have buckling and we have all sorts of other things that happen. We'll just touch on a couple of them. So we'll walk through these and we'll walk through how the lithology has helped us understand these. And then we'll relate that back to gold mineralization. So folding, we talked a lot about folding. We talked about how those dikes and those sets of QFP lenses help define the deposit scale fold. So that's what we see right here. Here are those dikes and those QFP lenses, the ones that we recognize to be following stratigraphy more or less. Here's that, that granitic web lake intrusion that's dipping to the north. And so com combining these things, combining our structural data from surface, combining our oriented core data, we're able to, to generate generalized, we call them form surfaces, essentially like generalized surfaces that mimic the geometry of the stratigraphy within the deposit. And you can see that when we do that, uh, the deposit is in the south limb of a small scale antiform. This is the trace here uh, in red of the main mineralized horizon, our, our mine shear. So you can see that it does follow stratigraphy, but it also locally cuts through it. We'll look at that a bit more detail later. If you prefer to look at things on a stereo net, like I do, or like I've been told most people don't apparently. <laughs> uh, you can see the same type of thing, clusters of south dipping and north dipping foliations with your axial plane, uh, roughly east, west, um, obviously more south dipping foliations with the mines on the south limb of the pole. Uh, we'll visualize the fold in a different orientation. So what we've got here is uh, on this map to the right is a bunch of lineations that we've measured in the field. You can see them in the stereo net as well. So you can see the bulk of the lineations plunge shallowly to the east southeast. Uh, there are some the other way, the whole thing is kind of uh, doubly plunging, but for the kind of sake of, of what we need to learn here is, is the, this main upright folding is shallowly plunging to the east southeast. And that plunge orientation of the fold axis is coincident with the geometry of our QFP lenses. So we can think of these as lenses that have probably preferentially been in place along some type of, you know, parasitic fold along the south limb of that fold. And that's a lot of structural geology words, sorry, I apologize. Uh, right here, there are those QFP lenses. And there we see them again here. And then if we look in, uh, in plan view, we can, and we roughly model the contact between our, our porphyritic rock that hosts the mine and the mafic sequences surrounding it, we have this green wireframe here. And you can see that whole thing is also plunging shallowly to the east, southeast. Here's the main mineralized horizon uh, defining the mine sitting within that body. So that's the early stage folding. That's the compression. And now we're going to look to the next event, which is the, uh, 
this the the more strike slip event where we form a lot of the structures that host the mineralization. So these are our mine shares. These are, are probably our most important structure because they host the gold. Uh, here's an example from a face and an example in core. So you can see that these are, if you were to remove all of that silicon veining, it would, it would be a fairly typical shear zone, you know, meter to, you know, I should say decimeter to multimeter wide, uh, brittle ductile shear zone. You add in the, the mineralization, you have laminated veins, uh, variable degrees of silica, sulfide. Um, you add in extensional veins and things get better as well. When we look at the distribution of, or the, the geometry of these structures, this is a plan slice in the bottom right of, of, these, uh, of these mineralized shear zones. And you can see that, that they're not kind of trucking along linear, intense first order structures. They're, they're wavy, they're anastomosing, there's clusters of them. And, uh, and, and this is gonna play into how we go exploring for these things along strike. Um, the, the production geologists can, can attest to that when you're underground and, and you're looking at these things, you know, you're often, it's beautiful, it's mineralized, it's, it's fairly significant and you go several rounds later and, and if that structure is dissipated into next to nothing um, and had you not known that it was so endowed, you know, a few meters the other way, you wouldn't even think anything of it. Uh, so that's the nature of, of these things. And, and it's also it, fairly familiar to what we'd expect to see in nature, this type of kind of anastomos and clusters of, of structures. You can also see that, uh, that, so we displayed our assay data greater than three grams. And you can see that a lot of that assay data doesn't, not a lot, I should say, uh, a small component of that assay data doesn't occur along these structures and it's in oblique orientations to it. And so some of this is gonna come into play when we start to figure out what structures or what are the controls in placing these mine shears, because we know by looking at them and, and exploring them that they're not first order structures that truck on for kilometers. These are you know, likely second, third order type structures. So continuing to look at that, uh, that kind of strike slip transpressional event, uh, we'll look at these Southeast faults and vein arrays. So in the bottom right, those are, uh, those are the dikes that we looked at early on in the presentation. And, uh, and we see these Southeast structures expressed in a variety of ways. One, one of our indications that they're there is the presence of, uh, of lots of diking in this orientation. And then we can also see them locally, they're filled by these pretty diagnostic milky white laminated quartz veins, uh, like this one up in the upper left here. This is a face from underground. And you can see, uh, this is a plan section here. There's, here's our, our main mineralized horizon in red. That's, that's curvy, linear, and astomosing down this way. And then these red intervals are intervals of this milky white quartz. And, uh, and you can see they line up quite well. And they're filling a southeast structure that runs right into here. And where that southeast structure intersects our main mineralized shear zone, we have uh, very high grade mineralization and, we, and it's one of the primary controls on our high grade ore plunge. And so these structures are very important, but like a lot of things that are very important, they're, they can be very difficult to, to find and to understand. This is an example in core of, uh, of one of these structures. And if you were to look at that, I mean, it's, it's not particularly impressive. It's a you know, brittle ductile shear zone. There's a core to the shear zone, but it's not overly dramatic. There's some characteristic hematite that surrounds it within several meters on either side, but it's by no means a, a structure that you, know, you would instantly pick out as, as a significant thing. But recognizing their character and what they look like, we're able to pick them out more systematically and then using proxies like dikes and, and, uh, and these veins filling them in, we're able to find them, identify them, model them, and, and then we'll tie them back to mineralization later on. Uh, there's Northeast structures that exist in the same orientation, same general idea. Uh, you can see that they're a little more complex because they don't just control the mineralization like up here, they also offset it. Um, I won't spend too long here, it's same general idea. So now we're moving into some of the structures that, uh, that modify the mineralization. These are two cross sections on the right. Uh, the one on the left has assay data greater than four grams. And the one on the right has, uh, has several dikes on it, geology and whatnot. Uh, and you can see in both cases, 
there's clearly this uh, apparent uh, reverse offset along these structures. It ends up being a bit of a reverse rotation. And this is what these structures look like in core and underground. And similar theme, uh, you know, in a face, it, it's, it looks quite nice, but you can imagine if you had drilled right through that, you'll produce something like this, which is not overly dramatic. You have the core of the fault right there, and you have a little bit of damage hematite in the surrounding rock. Uh, but these structures are very important. You, uh, and we'll see when we look at the mineralization later, but you can see that you know, depending on their intensity, they can actually offset the mineralization and create some fairly significant gaps. And if you, under, if you know that they're there, then that's no issue. You find that gap and you go, okay, here's the structure, here's the gap. I'm gonna drill below it for, to, to find the continuity. But if not, uh, it, without that knowledge, then you might end up kind of guess, second guessing where to go next. A couple more structures that modify mineralization. So the, the mineralized zone itself is, is buckled post-formation. So you can see examples in these two face photos uh, in the center here, our main mineralized zone. This is actually that laminated milky white southeast structure that's about to intersect the zone. The two have converged right here and both are buckled on top of each other. Uh, variable degrees of buckling, or folding here, they're just folded. Here you can start to see that axial planar fabric forming locally, that buckling becomes quite intense and, and, these, uh, and that hinge is transposed and pulled apart. But what it does is, is a good thing for us in terms of mineralization because it essentially stacks the mineralized zone on top of itself again, uh, as you can see in the wireframe here, it doubles it up, not in, size, not in terms of grade, but in terms of, of width and size. Um, this here is a nice way to visualize it on a mine scale. This is the, the main mineralized horizon colored by the dip. So purple is steep dip. So where it's purple, it's dipping near vertical and yellow is shallower dip, say less than 50 or 40. So where it transitions from steep to shallow to steep, what it's doing is it's, it's folding. So this is showing us where that folding is happening. This, line, this plane in here is the axial plane of that buckling event. And you can see it's coincident with where we have that change in dip, which makes sense. So that's, uh, that's altering the geometry of the mineralization. Uh, one last one, we talked about these, these big dike faults that bisect the deposit. Here's a couple of them, uh, the, the, the two main ones that we've been looking at. We don't drill them too often because uh, because we're always drilling in the same direction of them as them. But uh, when we see offsets and we know that one's there, we can see it in the magnetic data or other things, then we're able to, we're able to, to model to the right spot instead of connecting things kind of across them. Uh, you can see here on the bottom left how, we, how that offset's been incorporated into, into the geology and the wireframes. Uh, I'm gonna skip over the alteration part for the sake of time. Uh, and we'll just jump to mineralization. So we've talked about it, but just to reiterate on what our mineralization looks like, we have these uh, shear zones that are pervasively silicified, full of sulfides, full of uh, quartz veins, and, uh, and full of gold. <laughs> and trends in the mineralization. So this is the same image that we were seeing early on in the presentation with the reserve and resource wireframes. And it uh, just has gold data greater than, uh, assay data greater than four grams overlaid on top of it to see some of the trends. So our main trend is obvious, our, our Eastern plunge here. So you can see it popping up over and over. And then we have a few other things that we see, uh, this gap in mineralization, which is actually where one of those south dipping faults offsets the mineralization, uh, as well as some steeper plunges like this, uh, this unit right here. So this is my favorite part. Now we get to tie them all back together to what controls them. So there's a few things that control the gold mineralization itself. Um, we, so the mine shears that host the mineralization form as essentially linking structures between these Southeast shear zones. And, and that's gonna be important when we go try to explore for these features along strike. Cause you know, our typical intuition is to just follow our, main, follow our mineralized horizon along strike. But if that's a mineralized horizon that's forming as a secondary structure within a separate structural corridor, we need to follow that separate structural corridor. Um, so it opens up new possibilities. Uh, 
other controls the intersection of these mine shears with these southeast structures is a major control on our, our high grade ore plunges, as well as the intersection of mine shears with, uh, with folded stratigraphy. And all of this stuff is modified by those two features we just looked at, buckling, offset along some of these uh, south dipping faults, rotation and offset along some of these faults filled with the diabase. So we're gonna recap all of that again. Um, so the southeast, so here is the example of the mine shears forming as linking structures within a southeast fault corridor. So in, in red is the trace of those, those mine shears and in orange is that uh, southeast fault corridor. And you can see them just from a kind of geometry distribution point of view. They're, they're essentially forming as kind of linking secondary structures between these, uh, these southeast units. And the intersection of them here is where we have a lot of uh, high grade mineralization. So if we look at that intersection, before we were looking at that slide where we had that milky white quartz vein coming in, here that structure is modeled in blue. In red are the, the mineralized shear zones and in purple are assays over an ounce. And at the intersection of these Southeast structures and our mine trend shear zones, you can see the clustering of high grade assays. Uh, we can look at that on a long section and in gray with the interpolant uh, superimposed is our, is our main mineralized horizon. And then in blue are these uh, Southeast structures and you can see all the high grade mineralization uh, plunging along that intersection. So that's that moderate East plunging uh, geometry. If we were to jump back to here, this geometry here is this geometry here. And a lot of those very favorable intersections, like the one Scott mentioned, occur kind of where these structures are interpreted to be intersecting. Uh, the folding as well, so that's another control the mineralization, is the intersection of our mine trend shears with the folding. So in this section on the left here, this cross section, you can see in red is the trace of that mine trend shear. And then here's the general orientation of the stratigraphy. That shear roughly follows stratigraphy um, where it's parallel to the limbs. And then as, as that stratigraphy shallows out, you get closer to fold hinges. It tends to cut through it. And where you have that intersection, you have uh, you tend to also produce high grade ore plunges. We're seeing the same thing in this middle section here. We have our, our shear zone that's running along and where it intersects our folded stratigraphy, uh, then we'll develop ore plunges. And that's what we're seeing here as well. The geometry of that ore plunge is quite similar to the intersection of these Southeast structures with the main mine shear as well. Um, so if we look at those collectively, it looks something like this. Uh, I prefer to look at it on a stereo net and you can see kind of the, the change. So we've got our main mine shear in red. We've got our Southeast fault here in blue. And then we've got different limbs of our stratigraphy in orange. So you can see the intersection of that blue and red plane, which is this blue line here, is slightly steeper than the intersection of our mine shear with our stratigraphy, which is this brown line here. And our plunges essentially, uh, our, our, ma our main plunges are controlled by a combination of these two features. So sometimes they're slightly steeper, slightly shallower. Some are controlled by one or the other or both. That's the main, uh, so those are the main controls on mineralization. And then why, so why do we do all this? Um, this uh, why do we measure this? Why, why did we, why did Alex have to cross the swamp to get there? Why is V just digging up samples in the winter? Um, so how does this feed into our exploration workflow? So we're gonna just start from in mine and move out. Am I, I noticed the time, am I good for a few more minutes or? Yeah, okay, so you had not, okay, great. So starting in mine, so the production geologists and resource geologists do an amazing job of uh, using all the geology at their fingertips to create the best wireframes they can. But as we continue to mine and we continue to develop our geology understanding, there's opportunities to go back um, to areas where we may not have understood the distribution of geology as well and potentially improve our wireframes. As an example from a couple spots in the mine uh, at, at upper elevations, 
So you can see in red is the trace of our gold wireframes. And then we have the gold assays greater than four grams on the left or greater than two on the right. And here, for example, you can see this trend of gold assays trucking along to the southeast. You can see the gold wireframes full of assay data up to about that point, and then pretty sparse assay data beyond that point. So this is likely one of those intersection of southeast mine trend structures. Uh, and the, potentially, the western extent of these wireframes has some limitation due to that structure. So we, you could, there's opportunity now to go back to, to spots like this um, in kind of update our, update our wire framing and potentially add, you know, you're not gonna find a brand new zone like this, but you have potential, you're near infrastructure, you can update your wire frames, you can maybe add some more continuity and high grade where you didn't have it before. And, uh, and maybe a few ounces will, will show up from that. So these are really low cost uh, ounces if you do add them. Uh, same thing on the right here. You can see some of these wireframes taking some zigzags, and uh, and whenever a wireframe takes a zigzag, to me, it's it's an indication right away that there's something more to the story that we can add. And so potential, same thing. Potentially, we have some of these these southeast northeast structures that cut through. And so using that geology knowledge, revisiting our wireframes, we have the potential to add continuity uh, both to the mine trend shears and maybe within some of these southeast structures or maybe at the intersection of those things, potential continuity up and down plunge. Same idea, uh, looking at wireframes still, but uh, avoiding adding in maybe not good continuity. You know, uh, for example, here we have south dipping structures. Uh, if we are under the impression that they're bounding the geology, you can see the assays, it does look like the the mineralization is truncated along these structures and then kind of continues up, then it's an opportunity to revisit the wireframes in this area. Perhaps these wireframes shouldn't continue through that structure and we can avoid, uh, we could avoid you know, developing into that area. I mean, the, the estimation will take care of all of this for sure, but, uh, but improving those, geology, those gold wireframes off the bat will put us in a better, in a better situation. Uh, and you can see, for example, here on the left, where they've done a great, a great job has been done to incorporate the offset along one of these dikes uh, to, you know, wireframe right up to it, understand the offset, and then continue the wireframe on the other side. Uh, same thing, here's an example where we're drilling uh, in one portion of the mine, and we connect it up. Uh, we, the, the, there's a wireframe connecting up these mineralized intervals. And there's potential, you know, we, we saw that slide early on where we had stacks of, uh, stacks of sub-parallel kind of anastomosing shear zones and opportunity to interpret some of those here and see if any of them carry any economic grade. And again, the wireframe has done, like the production geologists do a fantastic job, but this just gives us the tools to revisit some tricky areas and potentially add continuity and avoid dilution. So if we continue on with targeting, uh, talk a little bit about how we can use these principles to target in mine. So there's an obvious down plunge targeting that we can do. Um, and so I won't touch on that. I mean, we understand our plunges pretty well. We understand the drill density we need. We can continue on that direction. Uh, but what new ideas can this geology help us understand? So there's here on the left, we've got uh, a cross section. Again, you can see the mineralized, uh, the, the mineralized wireframes on the left. And you can see that intrusion we were mentioning on the right, dipping to the north, the other wire the mineralized wireframes dipping to the left. And you can see on the north, there's also shear zones in these gray plains here that dip to the north. So it makes sense, shear zones on the south side of the, of the fold, probably nucleating along the limbs and dipping to the south. And same thing on the north, but dipping to the north. So the intersection of our southeast structures and our south dipping wireframes forms an east-southeast plunge. And that's our main deposit plunge that we've been following. We've Historically, it's been difficult to develop a lot of continuity along these northern shear zones. Um, but if we go back in and we look at the geology now, uh, we can approach it a little bit differently. We can expand some of our southeast structures that we know are controlling mineralization and to the point that they intersect our north dipping structures. And that intersection would actually be plunging the opposite direction would be plunging to the west rather than to the east. So we have potential to explore and drill some of this mineralization 
in a different orientation and maybe add continuity there. So it's examples like this where understanding the geology or deposit can really help us target um, near mine more effectively and generate new ideas where previously we might have had a bit of a roadblock. So we'll take the same strategy and we'll move it to a kind of brownfield. I'm almost done, got two slides left. So from a brownfield perspective, here's the trace of island gold mine, uh, the surface expression of it underneath Goudreau Lake. Here's the base geology, our main uh, porphyritic unit that the mine sits within, that, that web leg stock there. And so this is the obvious uh, area for us to continue exploring with this, our property boundary here. So we've got this big, it looks like fold closure here. And, uh, and it's quite big though, it's several kilometers wide and we know these ore shoots, I mean, some of them can be significant but other ones can have quite a limited strike extent. Some of them don't, you know, don't uh, come to surface. So it creates quite a big area to explore and, and a bit of a challenge, especially when we drill some portions of this area and we don't have, uh, say we don't find the mineralized structure right away, where do we go, what do we do? Well, we can use that geology we just built up to, to refine this targeting. So same principles, we're able, we, we interpreted these Southeast fault arrays from, uh, you know, from our mine data and we extrapolate them based on other remotely sensed geophysical data we acquire. We're able to interpret more of them, in particular, this one right here, which is the same Southeast fault array that hosts one of those historic deposits, Kremsar, that we mentioned early on. So here we've got a Southeast fault array that, that hosts the deposit and trends right through all the stratigraphy and bisects the hinge of our fold right here. In blue is that fold hinge. So the, the core of that deposit scale fold hinge. And then there's a shear zone here that's been identified. So we're able to refine our targeting from a kind of multi-kilometer area down to, I'm not gonna say pinpoint data by any means, but down to a relatively smaller target of higher value that has all of the favorable attributes that we're after. And, uh, and so I, I find it really exciting to be able to take these principles that we develop through the model, through the mine, and then use them on this scale and, and really generate new conceptual targets, new ideas. Uh, and, and then once we go test these, inevitably we'll find out new things that prove that a lot of what we thought was wrong, but at least it's gonna allow us to have all that uh, understanding. So last slide, I'm taking this concept and applying it on an even bigger scale, a bit more of a regional scale. So here's the trace of the mine again down here. Um, that's that target that we were just looking at on the previous slide. And here's the geology on more of a property scale. So if we take that same approach, try to identify more of these structures through geophysics, through mapping, through other avenues, we can identify quite a significant Southeast fault array right here. Um, and we can use those same remotely sensed techniques to identify fold hinges, this time within the MAFIC sequences. And then for, this is just one example, we're able to kind of pick a target where we have the intersection of a major Southeast fault array and a fold hinge. And this area right here outlined in gray is a big glacial fluvial outwash plain. So essentially a large Delta, tens and tens of meters of, uh, of overburden. So areas where you don't have a lot of uh, tools at your disposal to really you know, generate showings or, or gold anomalies. Uh, so same principle, take this, apply it on a different scale. And I threw this in just because I think it's kind of fun. You can see these same geologic features affecting the geology on a belt scale. So this Southeast fault array right here is the same line that you see here and here. That Goudreau anticline that was mentioned at the start of the presentation, the big kind of anticline of, uh, of porphyritic rock within which the mine was on the north side of it. That's this guy right here. And you can see that that whole big fold looks to be kind of pulled into plane and transposed along this large Southeast fault array right here, which is this guy right here, which is also this guy right here. So we're able to kind of take these thoughts and use them on different levels and, uh, and hopefully generate, you know, everything from in mind to regional targets to maybe even regional concepts that we want to explore beyond our property. Um, so that's the extent of what I've got. Uh, obviously, I did not do all of this work or anything close to it. This was uh, a, all the work we do is a huge contribution from all sorts of teams. We've got a great team at Island, uh, all, of, all, of our, all of our geologists and students and technicians and drillers and GIS and database support people. 
Um, we've got a really strong technical team at at uh, at our our corporate office, uh, as Scott mentioned, Michelle and 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 Myron, uh, who help kind of drive these projects. Um, we work with consultants as well that uh, that help uh, help drive elements of the projects. June Cowan is a good idea generator. John Fingus is a a good all around at everything. Eric Krensky helps with a lot of geochemistry and and the mine exploration teams, the resource geology teams, the production teams. Um, it's a constant kind of input from all of them, um, as well as, of course, our management team, Scott and, and Renald and Michelle and Dean, who, uh, who kind of give us the means to, to do these projects and explore. So thank you very much. I'm sorry if I, uh, if I overextended the time limit a little bit. Oh, Carl, that was amazing. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Carl and Scott. That was, that was great. Yeah, it's really rare to see such, such a great 3D modeling being, you know, put put together an amazing, you know, huge amount of work uh, to unravel this complex geology. Uh, just kind of reminds me of when uh, Rich Money used to own the project and, and um, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was a bit of a struggling mine initially. And, and uh, then they made the discovery of the deeper, higher grade zones. And uh, I mean, I never really understood you know, what's causing that difference in grade distribution or why, why is that higher grade domain there? But yeah, I think your model shows a lot of good ideas there of the, the shallow, shallowing folding and, and some of the other plunge controls that really give you those high grade shoots. Um, yeah, I think there's a couple of questions already coming in and I, I, have, I have a ton of questions, but yeah, maybe sticking to the, to the, to the regional scale initially, there's, um, you know, I was wondering a, a little bit about the kind of you know, on a greenstone scale balance, like what's the key ingredients for why Island Gold is where it is? You know, what's uh, what's controlling it to be there? Like, is it the Goudreau anticline? You know, is it the good host rock? Or you know, what are what are your thoughts on why why it is there? I think there's a few there's a few key features. The ones you touched on, it's uh, it's the host rock. I think that the, it's a favorable host rock. It's you know this porphyritic diorite, not unlike a lot of other deposits. Um, and then it's where it sits in the, in the, we didn't go into too much detail on it, but the Goudreau anticline is a, is a big anticline and Island itself is another anticline. So it looks to be a parasitic fold on the Northern limb of that larger scale fold. So you probably add in a more complex fold geometry, and then you hit the whole thing with these, uh, with these Southeast Northeast, uh, structural arrays. So I think it's it's very much kind of the mixture of of all of the things that uh, that you need and and a little mm. bit of luck too probably. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, and in, in a lot of the rest of the Abitibi, you know, some of the story is obviously simplified, but you got a first order you know, best or porcupine or something like that, and then you're sitting in a secondary uh, structure coming off of it, or uh, it doesn't seem to be that simple here, right? So um, yeah, that's been a big. Uh, I don't want to say problem, but a big kind of debate for a long time in this area is where's your first order structure? Yeah. Where's your crustal scale structure from which all your secondary third order structures are coming? The thing that was your major early conduit. And, and I don't think that there's any um, agreement on it. I definitely have, you know, I can throw out some ideas. Um, for example, there, you know, if we were to draw a cross section of the belt on a big scale, you'd see a bunch of belt scale thrusts. Um, and my suspicion is that some of these features, potentially this dark one right here, is a mm. belt scale thrust that actually is a major domain bounding feature. Um, it's early on in this in the game, but that might be one of our major fluid conduits. Um, and so our first order structure here might not, you know, a lot of the belts, your first order structure is reactivated or progress or like continuously activated and and you see it at all stages of the game in your final belt distribution, you see that first order structure cutting right through the middle, that might not be the case in, in, in Island. Mm. Other options is that potentially some of these big late, uh, these big late, uh, what looks like, you know, potentially big late brittle faults are tapping into some type of deeper structure and are, are helping as conduits. And a lot of the mineralization is very late. That's also another idea. Um, but but there's definitely no consensus and no answer on it. Yeah. Well, maybe just following up on that, there was a question here from Clark. Uh, I guess it's mainly to Scott. Um, well, first of all, you know, congratulations, he's congratulating on the tremendous success of 
of you know that you've achieved and with the, with your team in the last years. And the question is kind of on the excavation potential, I guess, of the eastern part of the belt. So, you know, you acquired in 2020 quite a bit of additional ground there, that Klein and Edwards, uh, and then also 20% of Manitou Gold, which have a lot of properties there in the eastern belt. So, as much as you can, you know, speak to it, like, what are your thoughts on sort of the consolidation or the you know exploration potential kind of in that eastern part of the belt yeah it's it's a great question and um it's it, one of the reasons we did acquire trillium was you know as this model is developing we saw this fold um you know kind of the limb of the fold to the south dipping further to the, the south and getting closer to what would have been the property boundary as we continued to drill down plunget island east so the main strategic rationale for that acquisition was uh was uh, to secure that ground so that we weren't uh, we weren't going to be limited by any sort of a uh, you know land tenure boundary um, that 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 uh, that existed. So, um, and in combination to that, I mean, you see stepping out in the kind of the, the broader scale away from the mine exploration, you see some of Carl's ideas here that he's presented based on uh, you know the understanding now from the uh, the model. I mean, some of those structures, those key structures, trend onto that ground, and and, and you know those are exploration opportunities we will be pursuing on the, on. Uh, that expanded land package. And I guess the third point on uh, on investments and juniors in the area, I mean, we have, you know, we have these general ideas in terms of controls on mineralization. We look for, for you know, uh, companies that are exploring um, in proximity to our operations. So kind of, you know, the center of gravity for us is island. And, and, you know, we look for teams, technically strong teams that are exploring in, you know, uh, stratigraphy that we feel is uh, perspective. And, and, you know, there's examples of that, uh, in this belt with uh, with Manitou Gold and our, our equity investment in Manitou, as well as uh, Red Pine uh, in Wawa. Nice, yeah. I guess a bit bit more detailed question, diving into the structural geology of the mine itself. So, you know, what is the shear sense? Bruno de France is asking, what's the shear sense of uh, of your main east west mine shears? The east west mine, it's it's not evident. Uh, like you can you can. I mean, I guess I should firstly say there's not a lot of kinematic indicators. There, I'm, I'm certain that it moved in one direction versus the other at some point, but there's, I would say that it's it's inconclusive. You can find sinistral, you can find dextral, you can find a little bit of uh, you know, oblique movement, but nothing is uh, is conclusive or convincing. I, I, which adds to kind of the the picture that they very much look to be you know, in terms of significance, relatively minor structures forming as, as shears between other, other kind of bounding structures. Mm. That's right, I don't have a good answer. Yeah, it's a, a difficult question for sure. Uh, Frank Rasikov, who's, who's our uh, resident main prospector here with the, with the SPDA, and that actually triggers my memory is that he's giving a talk on his uh, prospecting tips on, on Friday, and I'll, I'll drop the Link uh, that's a, a for the Laurentian geologists and everybody's welcome to listen in on that. Uh, so he he was asking here is um, uh, you know your, your weekly mineralized structures are just as important probably as as drilling you know following the gold mineralization and can you recognize some of those structures with lidar geophysics air photos? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a huge component of our program. So on this slide, for example, all of these southeast fault arrays you're seeing. I mean, wherever you've got uh, maybe a little red surface trace, that's where we've got good data and we can go find them in core. But everywhere else, we, we, uh, we mainly use detailed magnetics. And it was one of the things we, you know, we recognized the importance of some of these structures. We recognized how cryptic they were. We said, how do we, how do we find them? What type of remotely sensed data can we see them in? You know, they're not sulfidized. We're not gonna see them in IP surveys or EM surveys. But we do see them by the way that they offset stratigraphy or offset geology. So if we're able to generate uh, a mag survey at a high enough resolution, then we can pick them out. And so that's what we were able to do. We did drone magnetics at a very high resolution, and we were able to map out uh, our, a lot of these important but cryptic structures. Yeah, that's a good. Uh, we're actually using drone mag as well up at, uh, at Fanlon, and we're just doing a second survey on a, on a different property right now. And yeah, it's been it's been amazing. It's so much closer to the ground, much closer spacing, and you can resolve really you know fine structures as well. 
and it's fairly cost efficient. Yeah, what I found really impressive was like we got did the same thing as you got as as best resolution as we could, and and it was at the point that you could pick structures out of the mag and then find those structures in the lidar and then have confidence that those are actually like rather than a lineament, they're becoming false, mm -hmm. um, which is a really like big gap to bridge I find from like a geophysical interpretation to actual like you know ground truth geology. Yeah. Yeah, a few, few more questions coming in here on the quartz feldspar, for example. Uh, Alan Smith is asking what the origin of the quartz feldspar lenses is. And Dave Burns is asking about the relative timing of the QFPs, the Web Lake stock, and some of the other felsic mafic dikes. Are they all pre gold? Um, okay, that. Yeah, so are they all pre gold? So I'll go the QFP. Is, uh, is probably a little earlier. I mean, I should kind of pretext this question with, I don't have the exact timing or exact age on any of these things. So it's, it's just kind of me doing some of this, but uh, the QFP is, uh, is likely a bit older. Um, a lot of that is from like the way, the fact that it's folded uh, conformably with the rest of stratigraphy. Uh, the origin of it, I mean, I'm not sure. Like the you know, the composition is quite similar to the actual host porphyritic rock, so perhaps it's from the same source, and it's just a slightly more evolved uh, unit. Uh, the dikes. Sorry, was the second part of the question? Uh, no, it, I mean it, it was a different person asking um, that. Um, yeah, what's the relative timing of the QFPs, the Web Lake stock, and the uh, various felsic mafic dikes? Yeah, so the so the Q so the I'll go to the Web Lake stock next. That one is definitely pre-mineral as well, um, because it's mineralized. Uh, it, the Magino mine adjacent to us is hosted within that stock, so it's pre-mineral. I think that there is an age on it. it. I don't have it off the top of my head. If Michelle's on the call, she she might know. Um, and then the dikes are variably aged. Some are pre-min, some are sin-min, and some are post-min. Um, some are, as you'd expect, some are conformably folded with stratigraphy. If I kind of jump back to, if I jump back to the slide with the, here we are. So, I mean, on a very simple level, these ones are certainly pre-min, they're folded as part of kind of the larger package. And then these ones and these ones are variable between, uh, between sin min and post min, but they tend to cut through the folded stratigraphy, so they're a little bit later. Mm. Yeah, and then on the age dates, uh, yeah, I guess Bruno is asking whether this 2672 uh, MA old dike that is undeformed, to which dike set does that correlate with? Do you, do you know which one he means? 2672. Dike Wait. that is under oh the age twenty six seventy two that's under four yeah 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 which dike I have to go back if Michelle's on the call I'm not sure if she's there she'd probably know better than me I don't yeah. I, I think she might have dropped uh, uh, okay um I'd have to I can get back to uh, I can get back I, to it's Bru that yeah it's Bruno so you can probably okay. uh, yeah Bruno I'll send you an email on it uh, there's definitely a lot more information than I'm saying on it mm hmm um yeah somebody else is answering that it's the web lake the one that bruno it's a, a semi i think carl oh perfect that's who we should have referred to all right well let's let's a conversation going on here but yeah ian campos is asking that um from memory that you pointed out the key mine mineralization gap coincides with the south reverse fault yeah i remember that as well like you're showing that and there's a gap in the mineralization do you see similar faults on the northern limb of the F1 fold, or would you expect them? So we don't have enough resolution in drilling to, to be able to know that. Because for example, the south dipping fault, hey Ian also. <laughs> uh, so we are really able to resolve this from, uh, from the offset in geology, rather than actually seeing the fault itself directly. Um, on the north limb, we we haven't explored it uh, extensively enough to to be able to see it through those kind of that same approach. So I'd say the answer is I don't know. 
Um, the other question would, the, the other kind of part answer to that would be, these are, these look to be potentially kind of structures. If you imagine a bunch of south dipping thrust faults, uh, these would be structures that could be parallel to it that are probably, you know, as the belt is folded, they're, they're kind of pushing things up and some are late and reactivated. So I'm not sure if, I, I don't know if those structures, I think those structures would still be south dipping even on the north limb in that case, um, if that makes sense, because they're all kind of nucleating from the south, they're all dipping to the south like this. So even though you're on the north limb, it's still, they're still coming from the south. I know that's a bit of a hairy description. Uh, Ian, I'll send you a figure that shows it better. Yeah, I think you're still getting here uh, quite a few uh, structural questions. So we might, uh, we might refer them to, to you. Maybe you can drop your email address here. Yeah, absolutely. If, that, if you don't, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, uh, because yeah, there's still some more questions about the Metachuan dikes uh, and the throw being consistent with the diabase dikes. Yeah, lots of lots of good questions there. Um, but yeah, I think um, yeah, let's let's wrap it up. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it was it was amazing talk. Lots of really good discussions. Obviously, it it, it triggered people's interests. Is yeah, it's not very common that we can see such detailed you know amazing geology models of uh of, of a major gold deposit so, <laughs> so there's lots we can learn here from this and then just a reminder for everybody that uh you know we did record the presentation we're gonna work on editing it and hopefully we can in a couple of weeks from now we can put it on online i know somebody already asked here from the audience whether they can get the recording so uh yeah we're very happy we can you know uh, Scott has the permission for us to do that. And uh, yeah, thanks again for everybody. Uh, well, especially Scott and Carl for uh, for his amazing talk. And uh, yeah, if there's there's uh, no more questions. Uh, yeah, Amanda is just thanking us for, for the presentation as well. So yeah. Well, yeah, thanks to you guys. And, and if there's any feedback, I mean, it's like Scott mentioned, it's a work in, it's kind of our evolving work in progress. So we love, you know, if anyone has other ideas that that kind of came to mind, please shoot them our way. We'd love to discuss and better our understanding. Yeah, well, and that's the whole intention with these talks is to foster this kind of discussion because there's always a lot of good, you know, the audience is full of exploration and academia and government and, you know, experienced geos. So probably some good ideas still out there that um, you guys can touch base on and discuss. So yeah, thanks again for, for joining us. And uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the, the winter. See you, see you in, <laughs> see you in next uh, next meeting in the February. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Take care.